Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time, a show that comes to you live right here on Facebook Live. And joining me in the studio is Shaka Sally himself, a.k.a. The Kawale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hugely terrific, Paul. How are you? I'm well, thank you. And uh, a warm welcome to all our Facebook followers from all over the world. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to ask uh, real questions uh, to Shaka himself. Uh, Shaka, uh, let's uh, uh, talk about a lot of things today, but uh, I wanted us to start in Kenya. Uh, interesting developments in Kenya. Of course, uh, the withdrawal of uh, Raila Odinga and uh, his uh, running mate uh, Kalonzo Musioka from uh, the upcoming election uh, that was scheduled to take place on October uh, the 26th uh, poses a lot of uh, questions. Uh, your take? Well, I have to say frankly that um, it's very, very in interesting and um, at the same time I could also say very surprising. Frankly, because uh, when you look back and uh, you look at Kenya, one would have probably thought uh, that um, it is the only country that would probably claim uh, to be democratic. And frankly, democratic in its own league, uh, especially when you consider the region where it is situated. We're talking about from India, the Indian uh, Ocean coast, to the Atlantic. There is almost no country, frankly, that can claim to be democratic there. Interesting. Kenya would probably have been, and probably remains, at least so far, uh, a country that, frankly, could claim that title. Uh, the opposition claims that uh, uh, the, the, the body responsible for the upcoming elections hasn't really taken uh, into consideration uh, the recommendations that were made by uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, do you think what the announcement they made today is the right move going forward? I don't know whether the announcement is uh, the right move going forward, but what I can say is that um, I have gone through what they call the... Uh, uh, irreducible minimums. Uh, these are 11 actually important points that need to be dealt with by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission of Kenya, uh, IEBC, uh, which is of course headed by Wafura Chebukati. Uh, and of course it was not only demanded really by NASA, the opposition, but in fact it was demanded by the Kenyan Supreme Court. I have not seen, frankly, any significant movement in that direction by the electoral body so far. Mm. Earlier when we were talking, uh, you made a reference uh, to one of the great uh, minds, uh, uh, Albert Einstein, uh, who said that uh, uh, if you keep doing the same thing, expecting the same results, then you must be crazy. Uh, do you think what is happening in, in Kenya is uh, uh, maybe has similarities of what Einstein referred to several hundred years ago? He didn't quite say actually uh, crazy. He kind of like said uh, it must be insanity. So he probably would have said this is maybe democratic or electoral insanity, so to speak, uh, or political insanity. Because let's face it, um, among the um, irreducible minimums uh, required, of course, uh, by uh, the uh, NASA, uh, was that, uh, for example, uh, you should make sure that uh, the chairman, uh, the chief executive officer, of the uh, Secretariat of uh, the Electoral Body, Mr. Ezra Chiroba, uh, must not get another opportunity to do exactly the same thing that he did or was supposed to do on August 8th. In fact, there is evidence when you read the ruling of the Supreme Court that the election in Kenya, in fact, did not really take place on August 8th because some of the important infrastructure uh, the servers and what have you, the kids, had actually been switched off on October the 5th. You're talking about three days before the election. This is a man who is responsible. And by the way, when we read the Supreme Court again uh, ruling, Mr. Chirova's name is one of the three that is mentioned adversely. Mm. But uh, there are some of those, uh, even including the opposition, they agree that the election itself was, uh, to, in their own words, uh, free and fair. What, what had issues, what had problems was the tallying 
and the transmission of those results. So would the you process, agree? The process. Basically, what it means is that uh, the results that were announced were not reflections of the will of the people, especially when you look at Forms 34A and 34Bs. 34Bs. Remember, the law required that the results that were announced at uh, the individual constituencies would be final. In other words, uh, the electoral body at the headquarters did not really have a right legally to come up with its own numbers. And so when you look at uh, the ruling, uh, you find that uh, what was announced was actually a result perhaps of what one would call creative accounting. And of course, uh, um, the opposition and a lot of observers say that, of course, uh, was the magic uh, which uh, uh, you could probably trace to a man called Ezra Chiroba. Uh, uh, President, uh, 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 President Kenyatta, uh, Uhura Kenyatta, has said that uh, even if the election was to be held three months from today or uh, whenever they hold the election, he will still win the election. Uh, does that mean that uh, he, he knows something that uh, maybe the other people don't know? Mm -hmm. uh, why is he so confident that uh, if this uh, election was to be held, whether today or tomorrow or three months from today, he would still win an election? Well, first of all, uh, if you look at, um, uh, again, the ruling of the Kenyan Supreme Court, uh, President Kenyatta did not win the election of August 8th. Uh, in fact, uh, the ruling almost suggests that uh, there was no election really held. The election was cancelled. Why was it cancelled? Obviously because uh, there's no way they could uh, determine who won the election, especially because the process was flawed. The process did not adhere to the constitution of Kenya, to the laws of Kenya. And so you couldn't say anybody or somebody actually won the election. Uh, what seems to be a difference, I'll maybe give an example of a country like uh, Rwanda, where uh, you go to an election and the president uh, comes out with 98%, uh, uh, to be exact, 99% of the vote. He wins by 99%. Uh, you look across uh, in Uganda, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, these electoral bodies somehow have uh, succumbed to pressure and they're able to announce results that do not reflect the will of the people. And I guess uh, it goes back to uh, maybe uh, Joseph Stalin's uh, thing, it doesn't matter how many people show up to vote, but what matters is who counts the vote. Why is the Kenyan example, why is Kenya as a country very, very different from uh, those scenarios uh, that we are talking about? I think uh, part of the reason, of course, is that um, Kenya, Kenyan is uh, relatively more or better educated. They are more uh, or better or uh, exposed. Uh, they are socially uh, and politically conscious, much more aware. Kenya, when you look at that country and you look at its history, um, when you put it in the context of the region, um, it is arguably the most urbanized country in the region. Uh, it could also be the most, in fact, industrialized country. It has the largest economy in that particular or general neighborhood, for that matter. Um, so the ball game in Kenya could not be exactly the same as, uh, say, in Uganda or Rwanda. Mind you, when you look at a country like Uganda, uh, Uganda's politics and what have you, or democracy, for that matter, Sometimes, in fact, it reminds me of what used to be in Kenya in the early 90s. The early 90s. You see, you do have uh, a multi-party sort of uh, uh, setup in Uganda, but for the most part, really, the elections or the state or whatever runs pretty much on a one-party state template. Mm. You still have the state uh, fused together with the ruling party, the NRIM. The Kenyans have gone a little bit away from that. Uh, but I think that uh, there are some players who are trying to figure out a way uh, of making sure that uh, they are probably indeed neighbors of a country like Uganda, not only in terms of uh, the physical uh, 
you know, uh, geographical situation, but perhaps even in terms of uh, electorally. Uh, because let's face it, uh, the last three elections in Kenya have had problems. In fact, the only election that was considered to be free, fair, and credible in the history of Kenya, which got independence back in 1963, was the election of 2002, which was won by uh, Emilio Mwai Kibaki, the kid from Nyeri. Mm -hmm. This is when NAC beat the ruling party, Kanu, and the flag bearer, I guess who, was Uhuru Kenyatta, who was considered to be uh, outgoing uh, president uh, uh, Daniel Arap Moi is a project, basically. Uh, but of course, uh, the election under uh, Samuel Kivuitu, 2002, remains the only election so far in Kenyan history that most people would agree was free, was fair, was transparent, was credible. And really, nobody argued. But when you talk about uh, the subsequent election in 2007, you know what happened in 2008. Raila, in fact, is considered to have won that election. And I was told by Samuel Kivuitu again, who was the chairman of the Electoral Commission of Kenya at the time. He told me, in fact, uh, we're having lunch at the Nairobi's uh, Intercontinental Hotel. And there are a lot of other you know, evidence around, frankly, that will tell you that, yeah. yes, Mwai Kibaki did not win the 2008 election. In fact, even SK Macharia, a man who happens to be the owner, uh, a founder, owner, proprietor of Royal Media in Kenya, and uh, has a flagship known as Citizen Television, which happens, in fact, to be, I think, uh, Voice of America's affiliate station. He actually testified before the Kenyan Senate and actually said Kibaki did not win the 2008 elections. That election was won by a man called Raila Odinga. Did he become president? No. He ended up being a prime minister. And you remember how many Kenyans died uh, because of, of course, uh, because of what happened. The other election, 2013, there is incredible evidence, in fact, incontrovertible, not to lie, but falter. Uhuru Kenyatta did not win that election. If he won, he did not win in the first round. He would have actually gone in uh, a rerun. And who knows what the results would be, but he became president. And now you see what happened. Mm. The Supreme Court comes out. Uh, Shaka, before we go to maybe to our comments and Liberia, I, I, let me ask you one more question. How about those people who say Raila Odinga seems to be the elephant in the room? He seems to be the one person who remains uh, in this whole thing. But a lot of people say that he's a populist. A lot of people think that uh, it's all about him. Uh, how do you respond to that kind of criticism? You know, in a free society, obviously, people are entitled to their different types of opinions. Um, I think that, um, unfortunately, Raila Odinga has uh, a problem uh, which doesn't really begin with him. In fact, it begins with his father, uh, a man who, obviously, most people would regard as uh, Kenya's founding vice president, uh, Jaramogi Oginga Odinga. This is a man, by the way, a graduate of your alma mater, Makerere. Uh, but in the 1940s, uh, when in fact uh, perhaps uh, your dad and your mom hadn't even met each other. Uh, but this is a man who was considered by the British to be, should be the first Kenyan prime minister. But he admired a man called Jomo Kenyatta so much. And Kenyatta had actually been locked up by the British and they had almost virtually thrown away the key because he was a man who knew the British very well. He lived in Britain for many years. In fact, was even married to one of their daughters uh, who bore him uh, a Peter uh, Magana Kenyatta, a man who I used to admire so much as uh, a BBC producer. And Kenyatta, they feared him so much, so they actually wanted a shortcut. Mm. They wanted uh, Raida's father. But Raida's father said, our leaders are in prison. They were at a place called Kapengulia. Eventually, what happens? Uh, of course, Jomo Kenyatta and others are released, and eventually, Jomo Kenyatta becomes the Kenyan, the first Kenyan leader. And so, the man called Jaramogo Ginga was considered by London and Washington to be a communist, because he actually had support from 
what was then the Soviet Union, now Russia. And guess what? Again, Raila Odinga studied in a country that no longer exists. It was uh, East Germany, mm. which was, of course, part of what they called uh, international socialism and what have you. And so he has had this tag. Um, and the people that talk about it so much are people who control the media, and that media is very much Western type of media. Uh, Shaka, let's uh, cross uh, to Liberia. Uh, Liberia, uh, something interesting is happening in Liberia. Uh, for the first time, I think they're going to have a transition of power from one president to another president without going to war. I wish uh, maybe these other countries on the East Coast could uh, maybe take an example uh, from Liberia. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, what's at play in uh, Liberia. Uh, you have, of course, uh, uh, George Weir, uh, who has tried uh, two times. This is the third time. You have the, the current uh, serving vice president, uh, Joseph uh, Bwaki, uh, also trying to uh, maybe to get in uh, to become the next president of Liberia. Your thoughts on Liberia? Well, first of all, I don't think it is correct to say that it is the first time that uh, they will, in fact, have uh, a peaceful transition from one individual to another. They have I meant had that after the before. war. Yeah, yeah you could yeah. say probably in modern Liberian history, you are right. Um, I wish that um, a lot of other countries in the region and indeed across the African continent were actually following and adhering their constitutions. I remember several years ago asking uh, President Helen, Helen Johnson Sarif. I said, well, I said, you know what? You come from a continent where the norm, or at least the new norm, seems to be uh, individuals who are in power like you, uh, when their term is about to come to an end, they engage in what some people say is political, constitutional, uh, you know, um, shifting of the goalposts, you know, something like uh, you shift the political, constitutional goalposts. And I said, uh, what about you? Uh, what happens, in fact, when your term comes to an end? Are you going to engage in that business or are you going to adhere to the constitution of your land? And I remember her saying, I will not uh, stay uh, even one day or one minute or one second for that matter. I will only adhere to the constitution which I saw to defend and uphold. And she's doing that. This is what should be done. But in the country where you and I come from, for example, you have reached a point where even a place that is almost sacred, really, you're talking about the parliament where people are supposed to be lawmakers, making laws that affect everybody, it has almost become a battlefield. Except that uh, this time uh, you have um, uh, security forces uh, going in uh, uh, in civilian clothes and uh, essentially making sure there is no such a thing as uh, parliamentary immunity of anybody. Yeah. Simply because uh, there is a move underway uh, again to make a major constitutional amendment. This amendment, someone would say, is like entrenched, an entrenched sort of article. But you know what? You have to change it because the incumbent president says he is going nowhere. And then you have Rwanda, as you said. Uh, you just have Kagame who keeps, uh, in a sense, succeeding himself. <laughs> In Uganda, it is Mr. very... It's the 99%. It's the 99% indeed. And of course, uh, he said that uh, um, it is the people uh, who came out in droves because they frankly feel that um, there is no such a thing as the Republic of Rwanda without Major General Paul Kagame, retired, but not tired. Uh, what lessons can be learned uh, from uh, Liberia? Of course, we have the first uh, female African uh, president uh, leaving power. Uh, chances are that there could be, uh, there is potentially another female candidate that uh, might uh, re uh, re uh, replace her. Uh, what lessons can we draw from uh, Liberia? I think she, uh, she obviously provides a great uh, positive role model, uh, not only to young girls who are growing up on the continent and in the African diaspora, uh, but frankly, she provides a great role model to the African continent. Mm. Uh, because let's face it, uh, um, she was given the opportunity to serve her people uh, and her contract expires. And she decides to say, you know what? That's exactly how much and how long my people expected me to be there. Mm. So I think, honestly, she should serve as a positive role model, not only to the young girls 
and the young men, you know, who are growing up, but also uh, to her fellow African leaders or rulers for that matter. Uh, if these people are put in the place, really, they hold a Bible if they are Christians, they hold a Quran uh, if they are Muslims, and they talk about protecting, defending, upholding the Constitution. They shouldn't get into the business where they make amendments of a Constitution for personal or political gain. Mm. I know that the Constitution is obviously uh, a living document and therefore can be amended. Uh, I am not stupid enough to think that uh, it is carved out of stone. But at least I think you should be able to respect it, at least for posterity. And so the other thing is that you should give a chance to other people. Because let's face it, who the hell do you think you are? I mean, there are situations like uh, Uganda, like Rwanda, like Cameroon, like Equatorial Guinea, uh, and I can make, name several other countries where some of these individuals sincerely believe that uh, they are probably uh, God's uh, political gifts to their own communities, to their own countries. In other words, unless they live, or if they are alive, unless they actually have to be in those types of positions, the countries won't be there. Yeah. Let's go to the comments, Sashaka. Uh, let's uh, stay in West Africa, uh, in Cameroon. Uh, we have uh, Tena Klaiva Afua. Uh, he, li he, he lives in uh, California, but he wants to know uh, about uh, President Bia's uh, silence on the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon, despite the government's uh, convention uh, to the problem. I don't know that uh, President Bia has actually been silent uh, because, let's face it, uh, he has been sending security forces who have been, been causing mayhem and what have you. Um, but I think that um, I would rather want to introduce some new element here. Mm. Yes, it is true that um, the Anglophone Cameroonians have problems in Greater Cameroon, no question about it. But I don't think sincerely it is about historical identity here. It is not historical identity. I think it is probably about neglect. I am talking about social, economic, political neglect. I think these people feel, and probably rightly so, because the evidence will point to that, uh, that they are sort of essentially uh, politically, economically marginalized, excluded. They don't frankly feel that there is hope for them in that arrangement called Cameroon. So I think that you need significant social, economic, political reforms. Uh, a quick follow-up on that. Uh, uh, South Sudan was able to use that uh, same argument, uh, really, to secede uh, from Sudan. Uh, they said that uh, they were economically marginalized. Uh, they, were, they did not feel like they were part of uh, Sudan. Uh, why can't uh, the Anglophones in Cameroon maybe make the same argument uh, to the United Nations and maybe secede uh, from uh, Cameroon? Uh, first of all, uh, the Southern Sudanese really had a point. There's no question about that. Um, I have been to the Sudan, and uh, you only need, frankly, to fly over that land that is known as South Sudan. There's almost no infrastructure. It is as if, in fact, it did not exist. You go to Juba, which is supposed to be, uh, it, it used to be the, the Southern regional capital, so to speak. There's almost nothing. As a matter of fact, the last time I was there, Paul, you can't believe this. Uh, you had uh, like a tarmac road, probably not longer than one mile. And I'm not joking. I am not joking. So they had a point. But then again, let's face it. They actually um, got a hold of arms, organized themselves into a fighting force. It started in, back, I think, in 1956 actually when uh, uh, the Sudan was given independence. So they started with the Anyanya one, Joseph Lagu, uh, which of course ended up uh, in a deal uh, under the then Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie in 72. Lasted for 10 years. Uh, Lagu became, uh, I think, a general and the vice president. Anyanya two, and then SPRM, 1983, my friend. 2005. Can you talk about Secret. Cameroon instead of going to South Sudan? Yeah, can you talk about Cameroon? What else can I talk about the Cameroon? Okay, let's, let's, I said that uh, the Cameroon... We are Cameroon, running out of time. Yeah, yeah, I said that the Cameroon, yeah. frankly, let's face it, they need to at least, when you think about the authorities in Cameroon, 
they need to, first of all, to listen to the voices from Anglophone Cameroon. And by the way, it's not only Anglophone Cameroon, frankly, that uh, is suffering. A lot of other Cameroonians, even in Francophone Cameroon, are also suffering. They're also complaining because of what? There is no democracy. Some people might argue that, you know what? Bia has been in power for 35 years, so it means there must be peace and stability. But you know what? Stability and peace does not mean the absence of war, the absence of internally displaced mm. persons. Mm. What it means is the, pres is the presence of social economic justice for everybody. Uh, we have time for one uh, question. Uh, very quickly, uh, what do you think of uh, uh, Biafra? Uh, do, we, do Nigerians need to attract international attention uh, to the uh, ongoing genocide happening in Biafra? Well, you know, the thing is, uh, Paul, uh, frankly, that, 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 that uh, uh, issue of Biafra requires probably an edition of Straight Talk Africa. Because it will take us back to the 1960s when you had the first military coup in 1966 in mm -hmm. Nigeria. And you had a guy called uh, Lieutenant Kano Odumegu Ojuku, uh, who felt at the time that, uh, um, you know, things were solved badly, especially after the uh, assassination of Ilonsi, Major General Ilonsi, who was a military head of state and happened to be Igbo, just like uh, Ojuku. And then, of course, uh, you had uh, the Igbos being really slaughtered, uh, being persecuted in the northern parts of the country and what have you, and running back to their southeastern homeland. And then creating a Biafra, uh, which, of course, they tried to defend for three years, but eventually they surrendered. I don't think, again, here is the issue, frankly, of historical identity. Again, I think it is about neglect. I think the people of that part of Nigeria, and rightly so, think that they have actually been marginalized. But then again, when you look at the Igbos, you have a lot of individual very successful Igbos. Tony Elumeru, who lives in Ikoi. You have Ojikaru. You have all sorts of people. Okay, very quickly, what are you talking about uh, on uh, Straight Talk uh, Africa tomorrow? We are actually going to be looking at uh, women in technology. Women in technology. Women in technology, indeed. Uh, I look and I'm hoping that, uh, in fact, one of the guests probably uh, will come via or courtesy of Paul Ndiho. Very good. Uh, on that note, uh, uh, we look forward to having you on another edition of uh, Shaka Extra Time. Uh, uh, stay tuned uh, for uh, the upcoming uh, shows uh, on uh, Voice of America uh, from Washington. Uh, goodbye uh, to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Yeah.